you can. Okay, let's get started in one minute. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And happy Oceans Day here at COP. Yesterday, I saw a sign in the Oceans Pavilion that said, we can't solve the climate crisis without the oceans. And oceans are critical for both mitigation and adaptation to the climate crisis. Oceans are currently absorbing 30% of all carbon dioxide emissions released into the atmosphere. Blue carbon or carbon stored in the ocean solution. Mangroves, seagrass beds, and coastal salt marshes help trap, retain, and convert carbon dioxide. And in fact, mangroves store three to five times the amount of carbon dioxide than terrestrial rainforests. But when they are destroyed, they release that stored carbon back into the atmosphere. And as a fisheries biologist, I would be remiss if I didn't mention what is known as the deep scattering layer. Up to five to 10 billion metric tons, you heard me right, B with a billion, tons of small fishes that migrate from the bottom of the ocean to near the top of the ocean every day. As they migrate up, they eat, and as they migrate down, they get rid of that as waste. And this is called the biological pump results in 1.2 gigatons of carbon being taken to the depths of the ocean every single year. Without the biological pump, our atmosphere would be 400 parts per million higher in carbon dioxide than it is right now. But just as critical to blue carbon and climate mitigation is climate mitigation. The fisheries, marine animals, and marine ecosystems around the world also provide food, jobs, and livelihoods to millions and billions of people. Globally, over 3 billion people receive more than 20% of their primary form of animal protein from fisheries. 800 million people's livelihoods are supported by fisheries, and half of those are women. And mangroves support 120 million people and their livelihoods. But the ocean does need protection. There are things that we can still do during the negotiations that are going on here at COP. Specifically, the global goal on adaptation must include a target for ensuring at least 30% of inland waters and coastal marine areas are conserved so that they can continue to provide ecosystem functions and nature-based solutions and contribute to climate resilience of coastal communities. I've been a fisheries biologist for 25 years, and we need climate-ready approaches to fisheries management. But we don't need massive new investment in technology, and we don't need brand new ideas. But we do need new partnerships. We need to enforce the laws and regulations that we already have. We need to protect our waters from illegal harvesting and extraction and from the illegal trade in wildlife and endangered species. Today, we'll hear from our expert panel on ways that we can make that happen and how the climate crisis calls for innovative partnerships. Here's just one of those partnerships. Oceans. Oceans. Home to spectacular biodiversity. And an ecosystem that provides food security and livelihoods for billions of people around the world. But unsustainable and illegal fishing threatens iconic species, critical fish stocks, and global peace and security. In response to these risks, World Wildlife Fund and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime have formed a new partnership to prevent and mitigate maritime insecurity while fostering resilience for coastal communities who depend on healthy oceans. And that partnership begins here. 
So the goals of the partnership between uh, uh, UNODC and WWF are to improve maritime security through information exchange, science and technology. Uh, largely, that means uh, that we are going to bring our own expertise in the field uh, in which our organizations work to support our member states respond uh, more effectively to maritime uh, crime. Cada socio aporta con lo que conoce. Eh, WWF ha venido trabajando en temas pesqueros, en temas de conservación del, del mar, en temas de conservación oceánica durante muchos años. Además ha venido trabajando con los sectores pesqueros, tanto industriales como artesanales, mejorando técnicas de pesca, mejorando eh, prácticas, eh, buscando mercados para eh, productos con buenas prácticas ambientales. La Oficina de Naciones Unidas contra el Delito ha venido trabajando en temas legales, en temas que tienen que ver con la estructura de, de estos delitos ambientales. Entonces yo creo que esa... Esa, esa visión conjunta entre lo biológico, lo económico, lo legal, lo internacional es eh, una comple un complemento importante en esta lucha contra el crimen, los crímenes ambientales. Actividades que nos parecen relevantes eh, están desde nuestro punto de vista vinculadas a la promoción de prácticas pesqueras sostenibles al combate a la pesca ilegal no declarada, no, no reglamentada, a establecer sistemas de monitoreo y seguimiento de flotas, a establecer sistemas de trazabilidad de productos pesqueros. Eh, desde nuestro punto de vista hay un potencial tremendo eh, de incorporar todos estos elementos a, a, al trabajo con, en, en el marco de esta nueva asociación con la Agencia de Naciones Unidas. And that framework has obvious benefits for people and nature. But why start in Ecuador? Porque somos un país marítimo. Porque tenemos una superficie marina, ¿no? Zona económica exclusiva, que es cuatro veces más grande que nuestra superficie terrestre. Porque somos una nación pesquera, probablemente la más importante del Océano Pacífico Oriental, desde donde operan flotas pesqueras industriales y artesanales. Because there is so much at stake in Ecuador's coastal waters, it is the ideal place to forge strategies and tools that can be scaled. What we are looking forward is uh, good success stories and tools that can be replicated in other countries to address uh, uh, similar challenges related to wildlife and environmental protection, as well as uh, tackling of uh, uh, transnational organized crime. Success in this partnership ultimately must be to reduce the risk of conflict and crime at sea over fisheries and fish stocks. It must ultimately be about reducing IUU fishing in Ecuador and around the world and to really help educate the world about the need for more collaboration and for more action on the seas, in the judiciary, in our public mind about what type of issue this is. These first steps are critical to successfully address the challenges at the intersection of climate change, ocean health, and peace and security. To learn more about this innovative program, go to worldwildlife.org. Okay, thank you very much. May I please introduce our panel and ask them to come up? I'll start with the Honorable Karina Barrera the outgoing Undersecretary of Climate Change for the Ministry of the Environment and Water in Ecuador. Ms. Siri Buni, the head of the Global Maritime Crime Program at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Tarcisio Granizo, the country director for the World Wildlife Fund in Ecuador. And Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of the US Senate. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll begin with a few rounds of questions. And as a reminder to everyone, we have a live web stream going that will also be archived. If there are responses you would like to make in English or Spanish, please do so. And you have a microphone next to you that can be turned on for the web webcast. So thank you very much. I'd like to start. Para Karina Barrera. Señora Secretaria. 
cómo contribuyen las Islas Galápagos a las esfuerzos globales de mitigación de cambio climático y qué está haciendo Ecuador para abordar los impactos del cambio climático en inglés. Madam Secretary, how does the Galapagos Islands contribute to global climate change mitigation efforts? And what is Ecuador doing to address the impacts of climate change? Thank you for inviting me to this magnificent panel. Thank you very much. It's a honor for me to be here. And it's important. It, it, it is a huge question. It's real. But you showed the, the video about what does Galapagos means for Ecuador and the, the entire world. However, uh, it's important to know what is happening about climate change related to Galapagos. We n require more, more data now to understand what is going to happen in the future. In this sense, uh, I'd like to say at the beginning, since the uh, scientific point of view, Ecuador during these three years have been working on the cl uh, oceanic projections, climate projections. And now we have understood maybe the future until the 2050 and 2080. The, the, these are projections and we know that the temperature is going to, be, to increase and on the other side, that the oxygen is going to decrease. And so maybe one of the main sectors that are going to be affected with the time is the fishery. And we understood that it's necessary more than ever to implement important actions to create conditions to be resilient to the future effects of climate change. Now uh, we have uh, information about what is going to happen with the acidification of the ocean the conditions are created to the first 100 meters above the level of the, mar, the, the sea. It is important to know that. And then maybe this information, people is understanding what is happening because effects of climate change <coughs> usually are just a word. But now each country has to understand and the people that live in this, in this site has to understand what does it means. We are trying to develop this language now, and the university and the academy are working on the different aspects, trying to get an adaptation plan. And now, mm, this is the scientific issue, uh, but it is important to say. Then, uh, I'd like to highlight the, the main efforts that Galapagos has been doing during these years. One of these is the innovative finance mechanism that is related to the debt swap maybe is the one of the huge in the world. And it, it is important to say that it was $1.1 billion saving created to the Galapagos Life Fund in order to uh, use the money that was saved in the debt swap to promote the conservation of the Galapagos Island with specific projects that are focused on preservation, conservation, but also in climate change projects. The creation of Hermandad Reserve that was announced in COP26 was the beginning of this process. It was not just an announcement, I want to say that. It was not just an announcement because it requires a negotiation. And then at the end, in, uh, at the beginning of 2023, uh, the reserve was created. Now we have Six, uh, uh, 60,000 square kilometers that are part of the Reserva La Hermandad. The 30,000 kilo square kilometers are no fish zone and the other uh, uh, 30,000 square kilometers are conservation zone. Are, but it is the the, the main challenge was to create this m m plan de manejo, environmental plan, a management plan. It requires to negotiate between different actors, and this is one, main, uh, uh, one of the main efforts to do what is going to happen in this place. And then uh, the evaluation of this plan will be done in five years. It's important to say that. This plan required to negotiate with the 
security area of the reserve, it was an issue, it was a challenge too, to increase not just, to, to focus not just on conservation activities, not just in adaptation, maybe plans, but include the monitor, the security monitor as part of the management plan. Then uh, the importance to create or to fund the monitoring activities as part of this whole mechanism and to incl include the monitoring, uh, the ocean monitoring and climate of the reserve. Data, uh, scarcity of data is one of our main challenges in this site. That's why mitigation and especially to the potential to absorb the emissions is not knowledge now and this maybe this is one of the, our main goals in the, for the future. Maybe now we have information to relate to, uh, uh, to oceanic projection, as I mentioned before. However, mitigation potential is not knowledge now. And the research plan, it's important to understand how the species are contributing, just, not, just, not, not just to the life, but to the livelihoods too. On the other side, I'd like to say that um, Galapagos has moved forward to a special initiative. For example, they have the, the first transition energy plan that was approved in, all the, in, in Ecuador. We don't have another plan. This is the first one. And we are, uh, the university, the academy, is developing some studies or some research related to the use of green uh, hydrogen too as another aspect, as, plan, or as part of this plan. And on the other hand, we are working with them, trying to have, to have uh, the first carbon project related to the energy sector. Mm -hmm. to some, there are some initiatives. And uh, one, one thing, one important thing, the first or the biggest uh, blended finance with the GCF was approved in Galapagos. $117 million were approved as a mechanism that is going to promote the tra energy transition to photovoltaic energy and then to include adaptation activities and to promote the ener uh, efficiency of energy with the local pop uh, population. This is an example of how the finance, the blended finance could happen, but it is a difficult because we include in this finance private sector, banks, and the uh, implementers agencies. So this is an important, uh, I think, an, another innovative finance mechanism. Then the work with the plastic pollution is another pillar that is being promoted from Galapagos. So mitigation actions are in the real life in the Galapagos. I just want to say maybe some important things, but they are not related directly, but they support the implementation of the mitigation worldwide. I agree, that holistic approach is so important. And Tarcisio, I'll turn to you now, and I wonder if you can follow up on those comments. The Undersecretary mentioned the um, Hermandad Reserve, a very large marine reserve that has the cooperation of other countries. Could you elaborate on how Ecuador is addressing some of these transboundary issues that involve other countries in the Galapagos, such as illegal fishing and climate impacts? Thank you very much for organizing this panel. Thank you, the panelists. Uh, yes, when you talk about uh, environmental crimes, you have to talk about uh, multi-jurisdictional approaches because uh, environmental crimes are multinational. So uh, besides what the uh, Undersecretary has, done, uh, has said, uh, one of the most important initiatives in which Ecuador is involved is in the CEMAR. CEMAR is the um, marine corridor between the oceanic islands of, of four countries, actually. It's uh, Galapagos in Ecuador, but also Gorgona in Colombia, um, Coiba in Panama, and uh, Cocos in Costa Rica. And uh, the idea is to promote not only a, a conservation area, but a security area, area of, of, for security of, of, of other activities like fisheries and transportation and so on and so forth. 
So the discussion now on CEMAR, the maritime corridor, it's what's the, the mechanism that the guarantee the uh, real importance of, the, of this corridor. And uh, the uh, idea is probably to build, to design a biosphere reserve of the four countries. It would be the, the first multinational marine biosphere reserve in that region. But it's uh, still under discussion uh, with all the changes in governments in the four countries. It has been a little bit a challenge to to, to put everybody uh, online on that. Um, also, well, uh, there are other initiatives like the uh, Blue Corridor between uh, Chile and Mexico. It's a corridor that it's been designed to guarantee the movement of uh, whales and other big mammals, marine mammals. So the idea is to promote among the countries from Chile to Mexico the idea of this uh, corridor for, for these uh, big mammals and, and other species, of course. And finally, uh, I would say um, we have uh, signed an agreement with the CPPS, the Commission for the Southern Pacific. It's a commission that it's a very long in history. It uh, started in the, in the 40s of the last century. And, and now they are looking that the uh, environment is an important part of the work of countries in oceanic issues. So this uh, agreement between WWF and the commission is going to be a good uh, starting point to think not only the marine issues as, as fisheries and transportation, but also environment. So that's more or less the, um, is the, the scope of the activities, uh, multinational activities that we are promoting. Okay. Thank you. You're really highlighting the importance of cooperation on multinationalism and multilateralism. So Siri, let me ask you, considering the unique biodiversity of the Galapagos, what role does maritime security play? We've already had both of our speakers allude to it, but can you, as a member of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, talk specifically about those relationships and why it matters? Thank you, Sarah, and Madam Secretary, Senator, our WWF partner. Uh, thank you so much for inviting UNODC and the Global Maritime Crime Program. We are focused on maritime security, and we have partnered with WWF, as we think. And maritime security has a role to play when it comes to protecting uh, blue carbon. And specifically to your question, I want to just first put it in context and looking at the geographical and historical isolation of the Galapagos Islands that has given rise to um, the degree of biodiversity with more than 2,900 existing marine species, whereas recorded 8.2 are endemic. Uh, also with reference to the Paris Agreement, which recognizes the significance of ocean and coastal ecosystems in both mitigating and adapting uh, to climate change. But nevertheless, uh, in this regard, when discussions at the UNF Triple C often neglect this essential ocean climate nexus and the role of maritime law enforcement in strengthening ocean climate action. Also, the 2030 target, targets outlined in the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework translates to a need for enhanced enforcement at sea, particularly concerning the MPAs, but uh, also countries aims to step up the conservation efforts. Again, due to its geographical location, more than 500 nautical miles away from the main line of Ecuador, enforcing maritime laws in the Galapagos are quite challenges, challenging, and these maritime law enforcement authorities are often not equipped in order to respond to uh, maritime crime uh, happening in their waters and called on to respond to a variety of different crime, uh, environmental crimes, particularly fisheries crime perpetrated by both local and international fishing vessels. Now, going back to the fact that we have uh, done a partnership with the WWF last year at COP27, we uh, did an analysis paper which was launched uh, at the event where we explore the nexus between crimes affecting marine ecosystems, biodiversity, loss, and climate change. Well, the paper claims that illegal 
and criminal activities at sea, including marine pollution and crimes in the fisheries sector, may contribute to marine biodiversity loss, jeopardize food security by threatening sustainable fisheries, as well as spark potential resource conflicts among coastal communities. The destruction, exploitation, as well as degradation resulting from illegal and criminal activities at sea are key drivers of carbon ecosystems degradation, including mangroves, seagrass, and coral reefs. Now, some of the recommendations from the paper uh, are looking at integrating law enforcement and criminal justice systems into conservation and climate action efforts by encouraging more dialogue between uh, law enforcement, criminal justice actors, and ocean science climate experts, such as what we're looking at uh, in our partnership, supporting uh, the justice system to prepare for impacts of climate change as a threat multiplier for international maritime security, including the emergence of new crimes resulting from changes in migratory fish patterns and diminishing fish stocks. And this is also evident in your newly launched WWF Ocean's Future platform uh, on science-based predictive analytics for future fisheries conflict uh, hotspots. Now, despite covering, and I think it was mentioned already, but uh, 133,000 kilometers, uh, the Galapagos Marine Reserve remains comprised without effective monitoring and robust enforcement by law enforcement agencies, especially against organized crimes in the fisheries sector. And without significant improvement in legal uh, approaches, including the use of technology and scientific information to improve evidence collection at sea, maritime crime will undermine protection and blue carbon sinks and nature-based solutions. Thank you so much, and that's an excellent introduction to my question for Senator Whitehouse. Senator, you've been a leading voice in the U.S. Congress on the security side of illegal fishing, even successfully including IUU provisions as part of the annual authorization bill for the Defense Department. Can you speak to your efforts there, including why you see this as a security issue, and what additional steps the U.S. government take to address IUU globally? Sure. First, let me thank World Wildlife Fund for the outstanding work that you do. I'm here because I have such high regard for the organization and for Carter Roberts, and you've stolen onto your board two of my best climate allies, Bob Litterman and Larry Linden. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. We've actually been able to do a lot of good work on uh, pirate fishing, we call it. Um, in the United States Congress, we got the Port States Measures Treaty approved, along with three other fisheries treaties. People say that the Senate moves very slowly. We did all those treaties in one afternoon, so that was a very good afternoon's uh, work. Um, we've been working with the uh, Coast Guard and the military to improve their coordination on offshore fisheries enforcement. When I first began this and I asked the U.S. Navy, what can you do to help with offshore fishing, they basically said, You're, don't, stop bothering us, that's not our job, and call the Coast Guard. And then a few years later, the AFRICOM four-star announced in one of his presentations to the Senate that uh, we really needed to improve our game on fisheries enforcement in order to be effective in that area. And with that, the Navy and everybody else started paying more attention. So when I was at the uh, Oceans Conference in Panama, you had the Secretary of the Navy and the Deputy Commandant of the Coast Guard talking to each other about how to plan better on uh, pirate fishing. So that's beginning to move forward. We're also beginning to do a better job of deploying the intelligence information that we have, including satellite overheads with the NGO community that is out doing real-time enforcement, looking for the kind of behavior that signals uh, illegal fishing. Uh, Senator Sullivan of Alaska, a big fishing state, and I have a international fisheries enforcement bill that would blacklist and create sanctions and consequences for being involved in pirate fishing. And that's moving through the Commerce Committee with the target to get into the next year's National Defense Bill. Mm -hmm. And we have two big treaties that are pending right now. We have the High, High Seas Treaty, 
which the Biden administration has not formally sent to the Senate, so we can't get started on it. Uh, but I think at some point we will. And of course, we have the long overdue Law of the Sea Treaty that a Republican group of national security experts is trying to push the Republicans in the Senate to support. So what we could have is really a very robust array of resources available to uh, protect against this. The obvious reasons here is that you're damaging real markets for fisheries when you're allowing pirate fishing in. And the pirate fishing fleet is engaged in all sorts of horrible behavior well beyond its horrible fishing behavior. The way they treat crew is disgraceful. In some cases, it's modern day slavery. They're a vector for transmission of all sorts of other things like illegal weapons. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a pretty toxic uh, problem. And if we can solve it so that there is no longer rampant illegality on the high seas, it'll be to everyone's advantage. Fantastic, thank you so much. We have another round of questions planned, but I know we're going to stop about 10 minutes till noon, so I'm wondering if anyone in the audience has a question that they would like to pose to our panelists first before I kick it back to the panelists. Are there any questions? Yes, sir, and we have a microphone. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this panel. Uh, my name is Javier Davalos from the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense, AIDA. Uh, I'm from Ecuador originally, so very uh, happy to see the developments in, in my country. I just wanted to ask, um, with the ex expertise of the panel, uh, about uh, the swap debt in, in Ecuador. Uh, if it's been uh, on the news for, for a long period, and it could be an interesting uh, way forward for another countries to protect biodiversity and, and the oceans. And this one was related to the Galapagos Island. So I would like to ask uh, like your views on that and your positions on that and the relation with the uh, maritime security as well, like how this kind of uh, debt SWAT uh, can help also for, for security issues and not only biodiversity or um, ecosystems protection. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the debt swap in Ecuador was a good news for the world. Uh, in the case of, I, I think that every one of us are learning about what is the potential to do that. But I, I think that the first one is to have an uh, environmental management plan that includes the monitoring system and that requires to make some agreements with the defense ministry, for example, in order to in, in, uh, implement monitoring activities. And the, the uh, whole view, it is not just, if, for example, if you ask to the minister of environment, maybe our point of view could be related to the conservation. However, when you have more actors in the space, the new activities, especially that are activities related to protection and to security, now are being included as part, and, and they have the resources to do that and to implement actions uh, data because we don't have enough. Sometimes the data is not enough to understand what is happening in a holistic manner, not just conservation, it's climate, it's security, and all the information is going to be used in the future to develop m better policies, public policies. And just to complement that, uh, there are some issues that are going to be supported by the funds of the, of the debt swap. One is, of course, the protection, conservation of the Hermandad and probably Galapagos, the whole national park and, national, and Galapagos Reserve, Marine Reserve, but also they su support the uh, activities of uh, artisanal fishermen. That was part of the negotiation with the fishermen in order to uh, reach the agreement to create a reserve. Uh, control and surveillance through the Navy and education and uh, research, because that's something that it's absolutely needed. Uh, of course, the details of how the funds, are, the funds are going to be managed, it's in, under construction and that's. Are there additional questions from the audience? 
Okay, if not, I'll turn back to the panel. And Tarcisio and Siri, a question for the two of you that you can attempt to answer separately or together. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the successes you may have seen from the partnership. We, we kicked it off about one year ago in the Galapagos itself. I'm wondering if you can share any success stories or lessons learned from what we have done so far um, that we might take home with us. Start uh, because uh, probably mm, the first thing I have to say is that it's an you, you, unusual relationship because it's it's not uh, easy to have a, a environmental organization in a partnership with uh, an institution that uh, it's uh, about uh, crime and and uh, and uh, you know it's it's something that it's it's weird to to understand why and I'm gonna uh, put an example of why. For instance, uh, lots of fleets of, of fishermen in Ecuador are contaminated with drug trafficking. I mean, they are obligated to carry drugs or to carry fuel for uh, drug vessels. So what, how they go to the ocean is uh, uh, under a permit of the Navy to fish. But they don't go to fish. They go to do these illegal activities. And what do they do in order to justify the fishing that they ask the permit for, it's fishing sharks because it's the easy, easier species to fish. And in Ecuador, shark fisheries is, 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 uh, is not illegal if they declare that they are by catch. Of course, it's an absurd <coughs> mechanism, but the issue is that drug traffickers that are in uh, some uh, artisanal uh, fisheries fleets come with lots of sharks because that's the way that they justify in front of the Navy the activity. So that's a very s clear relationship between uh, crime, a crime like the, tra the drug trafficking and environmental uh, damage because uh, some species of, of sharks are, are uh, decreasing the populations. So uh, what we have done so far with the UNODC agreement, first, strengthening the capacity of the, there's a, a, an, an, an agency of the Navy that is the DIRNEA, is the, the direction of uh, marine, mm, Escapes. I mean, it's the, the direction that uh, uh, care for the marine uh, habitats, both in the uh, continental Ecuador and in the Galapagos. So we have been um, providing uh, training in security and in environmental issues. And so UNODC is providing the, the training in, in, in security issues marine security issues and WWF is providing training in how to understand biodiversity and, and the species and why, why is it so important to, to, to take on that, to control illegal and reported and uh, unregulated fishing. Um, second, I would say we, we, we organized a workshop in Galapagos uh, for not only for the Navy but also for other bodies that are related to, to environmental crimes, the uh, prosecutor's office, the police, the Navy, the Galapagos Government Council, on how to address crimes to take place in the, at the maritime sphere. And uh, again, UNODC is, was their uh, uh, training in, in, in traffic of, of drugs and other things, and uh, WLF on, on issues related to traffic of species. So this is the kind of, of things that we are go, uh, uh, doing together. And it's, uh, it has been very, very interesting, very innovative in terms of, of how to address the environmental crimes in the, in the country. Thanks a lot, Tarzizio, and I agree. It's a very unique partnership, but I think we saw a lot of value in the expertise that uh, WWF sits on when it comes to scientific uh, and evidence-based data that can be the baseline for more informed 
uh, law enforcement and targeted law enforcement to protect these resources. So, as you say, there's uh, been a lot on promoting marine conservation and improve ecosystem resilience to climate change, but a lot of the challenges is really the lack of resources and capability and capacity of law enforcement in order to, to uh, address this. Um, as was said, we held two technical uh, assistance workshops that involved local institutions from executive and legislative uh, branches in the Galapagos. And in that regard, we developed guidelines for inter-institutional uh, coordination to address crimes. Uh, and this was then launched and endorsed at the side event held at the CCPCJ, which is the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Commission uh, of UNODC that happened in May this year. And this has sort of contributed then to uh, strengthening administrative uh, controls on fuel supply in the Galapagos to a tool to combat uh, fisheries crime. So that's going back to your sort of exercise and, and uh, project inclusion of, of targeting specifically this uh, element. Now, uh, we also have uh, involvement with, um, we had advised the Ecuadorian Navy during the uh, Galapex 2 exercise, which looks at strengthening maritime domain awareness and interoperability among multinational law enforcement actors. I also want to highlight the value of this complementary, I would say, partnership that leverages, as I said, on WWF in offering data-driven uh, predictive analysis, early warning, and preventive conservation solutions to uh, prevent conflict over marine resources. And then UNODC uses this information to deploy its res uh, not its resources, but state's resources in order to, so we actually uh, we are not a law enforcement entity per se, but actually working with member states in order to strengthen their law enforcement. So working with them in targeted um, solutions. And then uh, fisheries crimes are transnational issues and therefore it's required a regional and international response. Uh, fostering maritime law enforcement cooperative efforts among regional uh, countries to analyze trends and patterns of vessel movements will help improve uh, the coordinated and joint patrolling, uh, detecting and interdicting strategies. Just wanted to mention that implementing the multifaceted approach that we are doing that combines fisheries science, technology, capacity building, community engagement, which WWF is really good at and which sort of adds that uh, element to what we are doing. Collaboration and effective information management can significantly enhance efforts to combat crimes. Uh, maritime crimes in various regional, globally, particularly in SID. So you asked if we were to expand beyond the Galapagos and, and Ecuador. And we would think that some of these uh, lessons learned as well as expertise can be then applied to other SIDs as well, or to SIDs. Um, and then tailoring these approaches to suit uh, the specific needs and contexts uh, of different regions be, be crucial for success. So I thank you and really appreciate this, this partnerships and I think we have some good examples. We have developed these guidelines. Uh, we have some good relations and obviously having WWF uh, on the ground together with our staff on the ground helps in, in these exercises and support to Ecuador. Thank you. Thank you both. Senator Whitehouse, I know that you have to leave for the next event, but I wanted to see if you wanted to make some final concluding remarks, either about the topic at hand or for your aspirations here in Dubai for COP28 more broadly. Just how appreciative I am that World Wildlife Fund and the panel are bringing the ocean's concerns forward here at this COP. I can remember coming to the Paris COP years ago and hearing that there was an effort afoot to remove the last mention of oceans from that Paris COP agreement. And we've gone from fighting to have oceans even mentioned in the COP agreement to having an oceans pavilion, to having real resources brought to it. And um, I really appreciate that. I think that there are enormous climate dangers in the oceans. And I'll leave you with my favorite uh, scientific statistic, which is uh, the zettajoule. The zettajoule is a unit of heat measure. The joule, you know, is a measure of heat energy. Zettajoule has 21 zeros. It is a frighteningly big number. Humankind's entire energy consumption is only half of a zettajoule. And yet for the price of the fossil fuel component of that half zettajoule, 
of energy that we use as a species. We're putting 14 to 15 zettajoules of heat into the oceans every single year. So when you see that coral reefs are dying, when you see that fisheries are moving, when you see that uh, parts of the sea are deoxidizing, when you see that sea levels are rising, when you see uh, the growth of the uh, toxic algae, all of the things that we're seeing in the oceans, we have a lot more coming and we really need to focus on oceans. So thank you all for your work to make sure that oceans are a part of our climate response and to make sure that healthy oceans and legitimate, honest, uh, properly enforced fisheries uh, protect those oceans. So thank you. Thank you. And Secretary Barrera, I wonder if we could end with you. We've heard a lot about some of the problems and some of our solutions. Could you give us some hope here at the end? What are your, what, what gives you optimism or what gives you hope that you see here at COP or here in, or in Ecuador? Thank you. Um, I think that we are understanding now what is the, the link between conservation and climate change. We are more clear about that. The oceans is part of the discussion now. You know, the NDCs in our countries doesn't, don't include the uh, ocean as part of the mitigation actions. Now we are moving forward to include oceans as part of our strategies, national strategies. This is, I think, that uh, maybe in the short term we are going to have more indices, including oceans, as part of the, our compromises. On the other hand, um, I think that the debt swap in Ecuador maybe is a hope for everybody <laughs> that there are innovative mechanisms that could be used to conserve and to fight the, the, the climate change. Ecuador is not just saying, give me money. We are proposing what new mechanisms can work, and this, tri this kind of work that we are been doing now Maybe with the time we have, we will have experiences and lessons learned to share with everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me see if there are any other questions from the audience. Yes, Maria Ines. One second. It's a question and a comment. The question is how we can find out the, a better mechanism to put together all the actors in a good dialogue for a great, smarter, efficient governance, and how we increase the co-benefits for coastal communities. So we are really worried about what is happening in terms of our illegalities, and we know that that affects directly the people or the quality of people's life. So how we can put together all of these elements. Well, I, I think we have started somehow with some of the key partners, but I think that can be expanded as well. And you might want to add specifically when we also look at the coastal communities and engagement directly with, with the, these communities in, in how to, we have seen it from the uh, criminal justice partners and the inter, uh, inter-agency uh, coordination and cooperation in order to ensure that everybody that needs to respond to this are involved and, and sitting by the table, but I think, uh, at the table, but I think what's key is also to involve the coastal communities in the work we're doing and expand on such. I, I don't think it's an impossible uh, undertaking, but I think it's very key in order to have all voices heard, but also all actors in order to respond to this more comprehensive approach. But I let you add to your experience on the ground as well. I would say the most important thing is understand how is, what's, what's the problem and who is involved in the problem. Because if we are trying to save marine biodiversity and we need to understand that marine biodiversity is affected by some activities, that some activities have actors behind that and the uh, markets and uh, even political relations that we need to understand and to address in order to have the uh, holistic, let's say, response to, to these problems of the, of the uh, conservation of biodiversity and securing, for instance, fish, fisheries stocks for, for um, food security. It's important 
and that's why we need to understand who is who is who are the actors who are the stakeholders that are part of all this very complex thing which is the uh, the marine ecosystem and and their human activities uh, that are beyond that and once you identify the problem as complex as, as it is, you will find the, real, the, the, the right actors to work with. Any final words from our panel? Just, just to mention that uh, as a complement uh, to, to the uh, situation of sharks, we are starting a, a project funded by USAID to conserve sharks and rays in Ecuador uh, through uh, management of some fisheries, uh, through research and education, and uh, trying to understand precisely these complex uh, networks besides the, um, beyond the uh, um, endangered species of sharks and why they are endangered. So. Madam Secretary, any final words? No, thanks to, <laughs> to bring this, um, I think this matter to this space. It's important to promote the, what the ocean means for the climate change. And I, I think that adaptation and mitigation have a real impact in the coastal sector and the oceans are part of the solutions because they absorb 25% of the emissions. And, the interaction between biodiversity and climate change is really, um, we can really see in the ocean. You know, 0.5 degrees is the temperature that we need to change the um, turtles. You have more female turtles if you have point degree increase. It's real, the change of the life there. Yeah. No, thank you for initiating this, and it's interesting to see how it evolves over time and what the senator mentioned, that they were fighting to get even oceans uh, as part of this, and now slowly we're also getting maritime security in the, in the, the discussions, uh, which I appreciate, and, and, uh, the, as well as the partnership. But uh, I guess acknowledging this nexus between uh, environmental crime and then climate change and then adding maritime security to, to this in the response. So I appreciate that. So hopefully at the COP29, we also have more to <laughs> report back on, on this uh, partnership and how we, thank you. Please help me thank our panelists. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of Ocean's Day and help yourself to some of the food and beverages.